the start of a new year. <laughs> yeah, maybe Robert, you can start uh, the webinar by saying a couple of words or something like that. Okay, <laughs> Actually, I, a couple I, of words about Hans. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, okay, I, I will. Um, first, welcome Hans Levenbach. Uh, Hans has been quite pivotal in my career. I don't know whether you would regard that as a good thing or a bad thing, but I regard it as a good thing. Uh, um, I'm sure it's not my remarks that's moving Hans to. Like, um, Hans worked um, for, uh, for a while, quite a while, with um, Bell Labs, which became um, Bell Communications. Um, and uh, that's where I met him in the in the 80s. Uh, I guess these days it would be called a data science group, and I, I, I don't recall exactly, but one of his major responsibilities was in, in the forecasting area. Um, he's had a, a particular interest in uh, robustness issues, uh, both in statistics, but also in uh, uh, developing models and methods which are robust to the the variety of circumstances that uh, practical forecasters have to face. And um, um, after taking uh, early retirement from at and Hans was an early entry into the forecasting software uh, uh, business and uh, using um, spreadsheets uh, or as a basis anyway of the uh, products that he uh, was uh, developing and uh, and selling. Um, he was also very active in the International Institute of Forecasters, uh, serving a spell as uh, president. Me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Before we sort of continue, um, I thought that Hans was involved with uh, IAF at some point. In yes, I was just saying um, perhaps, yeah. uh, that uh, he uh, was very active in the IIF, I think. Uh, I think treasurer, but he's not here to correct me. Uh, but he, he was certainly <laughs> president um, and org was a, a key participant in organising various IIF uh, for uh, forecasting symposia. So been an, an important influence. He's a, got a number of books to his uh, his name, um, concentrating not so much on the uh, mechanics of forecasting methods, but very much on the linkages into the practice of demand uh, planning and forecasting in the supply chain. So, uh, and Hans has uh, continued his work in uh, as, a, as a practitioner uh, and as a, a software uh, developer designer uh, over this period. So Hans has got a, a, a lot to offer. The books themselves I've uh, I've been recently now? reviewed. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Can you see? Can you see this now? We see slides. Can you see this now? Yes. Okay. It's fine. I will start. I cannot hear you. All right. Okay. Uh, Good. Okay. I want to talk about a uh, new classification scheme for transseasonal retail and consumer data applications. I want to thank Ivan and Kondrika for inviting me for this podcast. I'm sorry that we have to start a little late, so I'll move right along. First, I'm going to start with a uh, an application so we, to motivate why I was looking at this. And then I'll show you what the methodology is all about and uh, some results. Um, when I was involved with the M3 competition, I participated with a software product called PP Autocast. This was a forecasting engine developed by the late F. Garder. Uh, it's called Damp Trend Exponential Smoothing. I was a little surprised at the outcome because I was expecting the seasonal models to do better than non-seasonal models, since this was monthly data for uh, retail and other 
industries. So I want to start forecasting with monthly data. So I'm taking the monthly data from the M3 competition, which had about 3,003 series, but only 1,428 monthly series. So I'm only restricting myself to the monthly series for this thing. Uh, the idea is to take an algorithm called ANOVA analysis of variance without replication, 2A analysis of variance without replication. With this tool, you can begin to show the variation in rows and columns of a table. So at the end result, you get a classification into six classes. They are homogeneous and non-overlapping. So the way that it works is that class number one, for example, is dominant in seasonality and over trend and an irregular. And I'll show you how that dominance relationship is established with the analysis of variance. So you can see you get six distinct categories. Uh, they're non-overlapping and they're in this sense homogeneous. So let me start with an example. We're dealing with time series, but we're not looking at time series in time. We're looking at time series in tables, two-way tables. And when you take, for example, a series like ice cream sales, um, which is clearly highly seasonal, and you put this in a table, you can see that the rows in this case represent the seasonality. Each row has a set of numbers that are more or less the same. And you can see that June is very high and December and January are lower. So this is sort of that seasonal effect. The columns represent trend. So we have five years of data here. Uh, to use this technique, you need full tables. So I was start looking at this for the M3 data because I was kind of curious why the Autocast engine from F Gardner was not performing as well as I expected. And so when you look at the M3, data, the 1,428 monthly series, you can see the number of series that ended up in each class. And you can see here that the classes with the trend dominance seem to have most of the series. So I could see here that uh, the trend dominance series are 58% of the total, and they outnumber the seasonal dominance series of only 14%. So this suggests that perhaps the trend dominated series would do better than the seasonal series. Yes. And it turned out to be that way. So it's kind of unbalanced data set in terms of uh, retail forecasting and consumer demand forecasting that I experienced in, uh, in the various companies, including the telecom industry for which I had my original start. Now I look at box plots of these three components, and I can see that the uh, trend dominated series are much greater volume than the seasonal. And anything that's not trend or seasonal in the variation is treated as irregular or other. In the seasonal series, you can see there's a lot of outliers too. So this distribution is very asymmetrical and that's, that was part of the problem. So here's how you, you use the method. The method is called uh, two-way analysis of variance without replication. This is very familiar to statisticians. They use it in agricultural experiments, but I've not seen it used in our context of forecasting. So here's the example of that seasonal series. And sure enough, it's very seasonal. Now I do the analysis of variance without two way analysis of variance without replication, which is available in the data analysis add in in Excel. Uh, 
and now I've got an R script so I can do thousands of series. And for the first time, I can kind of look at it this way. So the rows represented seasonality. So it's an analysis of variance, which decomposes the total variation into row variation and column variation, as, as well as what's left over. So these things add up, rows plus columns plus a regular or a total. So the, the motivation here is to, to interpret the rows as seasonality so that the rows percentage of the total is 91%. So that's consistent with this pattern. The columns are the trends, and that is smaller as well as the irregular. So if you look at the data, it's definitely very cyclical in terms of a seasonality. And relatively little trends, it might be declining slightly, and also slum departures from this regular cycle that you see in these kind of blips. The, that is then the irregular. So that's how I created this concept of the uh, classification and then applied it to all the N3 and see what I found out. All right. So there's a concept of strength and ranking. And I think there are other papers that I've seen in the journals that talk about uh, seasonal and trend strength and ranking. And I've kind of, uh, Rob Hyman mostly, and I've uh, kind of taken that, those ideas. So I define a seasonal strength factor as the uh, seasonal SS column versus the uh, SS column plus SS error, error. So that percentage, the fraction rather, is what is called the seasonal strength factor. Likewise, you have one for the trend factor. But that is not enough because of the scale of these numbers. By creating something called seasonal influence factor. And a seasonal influence factor varies between zero and one. And the trend influence factor also varies between zero and one. So this quantity that you see here coming directly from the analysis of variance table uh, creates a, a unit square. And the top part of the unit square is a seasonal influence. And the bottom part is a trend influence. And you can see in this, Diagram, diagram, if you combine these two together, it's a unit square that is much denser in a trend. So the trend series are dominating the M3 data. Now looking at all the six classes, uh, you can these are these top ones are the seasonal influence, the seasonal dominant, and the bottom ones that are trend dominant. So these are the six different classes. And the idea now is to automate the forecasting is to not look for a method that does all of them in some sense best, but to look at these homogeneous classes individually and seek a, a best model, model, like an ETS model. So up here, I would get strong seasonal models. Down here, I would get the strong trend models. So how does this compare now with the other competitions? So on the right table are the results for the M3. And then on the left table are the results for the M4. Now the M4 was something like 100,000, total 100,000 series. And the monthly series constituted about 48,000. So that's what you see here, 48,000. And you can see what percentage each class is of the seasonal totals as well as the trend totals and overall. And you can see that the differences between M3 and M4 are just very significant. So I wouldn't expect uh, an M3 winner to also uh, become an M4 winner. You know, the technique is uh, 
you know, it's dependent on the on the sort of patterns of these series. And I've done that for the S M5 also. And that was with the uh, Walmart data. And we got some insights there too about the seasonality and the nature of the seasonality, which is another thing to take up some time. But anyway, to summarize this, it is a data centric approach. We're not modeling here. And we're specifying, restricting ourselves to monthly trend seasonal data, firstly. But in general, you can consider any table to a table where you have the day of week, for example, against a trend. And, and I've used it in other areas like that. So it doesn't have to be uh, trend seasonal. It's a two way analysis in which the rows and columns can be interpreted as having some meaning. For example, uh, if you look at bank transactions, uh, they are also day dependent. Uh, the highest number of transactions are Monday and Friday and the lowest in on Wednesdays. And so a bank manager could then uh, coordinate with the employees when they could take time off, for example. So procedure then is you first explore the data. You look at the data uh, with some exploratory data analysis techniques like the one I was, I've described. Uh, then you make sure that you do data quality checks because this irregular component may be less strong if you can identify unusual values and outliers because they tend to distort the factors. So that's something that I would recommend you always do, although I don't see it as often emphasized. Uh, then you create the trend and seasonal variation using this ANABA technique. Um, it's very straightforward. It's just sums of squares and averages. It's not, it doesn't, it's just arithmetic. Uh, you determine these uh, trend and seasonal factors or influence factors and see how they associate with what you see in the real data. That makes sense. Of course, you need to validate these things by trying out different models that best represent those sec sectors. Like I say, this is a uh, two-way analysis is without replication. It's very standard in statistical packages. Uh, it's standard also uh, in, in R. Uh, so there's not no special programming you have to do. I'm not an R programmer, but somebody put it together for me and it works very nicely. It was kind of funny. I tried it out on this 100,000 series and it seemed <clears throat> seemed to freeze. So I just went upstairs for lunch and came back and it was done. The original M3 competition with the PP Autocast was a DOS program. So that took a whole afternoon to run. So the opportunity to do this kind of analysis and detail was, was just not there. But today, I think we have a real opportunity to not just develop these models, but also look at how they perform and what it, what it means in terms of the data. We, this was a standard practice in the Bell system when I was a forecaster. Uh, we used to teach it in our, in our courses and workshops, but subsequently, while I had it in, in my textbooks, I never saw it really widely used or at least referred to. So how to find out about this? I have a couple of articles on LinkedIn on my, on my profile in which I show the details and examples. And it's also covered in my book, Change and Chance Embraced, which is, was the original textbook, but adapted to more you know, practicing people. And from that book, I've taken, I've written articles for LinkedIn posts and on the basis of the responses I get from people, I created then a smaller book 
called uh, Four Peas in a Pod and uh, illustrate these things in a little bit more detail to, to see that they really work. And lastly, there is a forecast manual for professional development that I used in my training workshops uh, throughout the world. Uh, that kind of died at, at the COVID time. Uh, I don't think I'm going to re resurrect it, but anyway, the, the training material now is available online uh, for self-development or for in-house training. And that also has this methodology in it. So that is the story. So a few takeaways. Uh, you need to maintain data quality at all time. I'm a firm believer that data kills forecast models. And uh, models do not tend to overcome these unusual values very easily. Try to understand forecasting algorithms in terms of the profile that it produces. So we used to produce forecasts for 18 months out. And so that is a profile. And so you should need to think in terms of accuracy and measurement of performance in terms of measuring the accuracy of the profile. And uh, that is a little different than this point forecasting accuracy. Well, uh, the other thing it taught me was that I should not be looking for a best method. So these forecasting competitions that keep looking for best methods, I don't think is a real fruitful thing to do. If you're a practitioner, you want to sort of try to classify the, your data into some homogeneous groups. And this is an exa STI method is one example of it. And then develop forecasting models and methods that are optimum or work best for these individual classes. I know we started late, but I hope I've caught up with the time and uh, more than happy to entertain some questions. Okay, thanks, Hans. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we have so, issues uh, with the You sounds. have my email address, that's on the title. I can send things about that and get questions through LinkedIn or email. And thank you very much for the opportunity to, to join you on this podcast. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Hans. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> if not to hear us. <laughs> yeah, a couple of words before we leave. So um, Hans is very active on LinkedIn. And so yeah, he has posts about that. And uh, I like the idea that uh, he have here that uh, you just do on, you sort of split the data slightly differently and you end up with a Nova test that gives you the idea of strength of strength, strength of seasonality. You don't assume much, you just maybe a bit of normality that you need to assume because it's ANOVA, but uh, you don't have any specific model. So please do have a look at uh, his posts. Uh, we'll try to do something uh, with this video. Uh, I don't know, Robert, do you have anything to add to the presentation? Uh, well, yes, I think, uh, I think Hans, concept of uh, segmenting series into its various components of seasonality trend irregular and the the weighting of those uh, i think is potentially Im well is important the the alternative um is obviously to fit a general model which has become a current um a, a current typical practice i would think which um and the danger of the general model is one of overfitting, essentially. So, um, you know, if you, you've got a, a low trend, if you fit a trend or even more so seasonal, you will find a seasonal co component when typically uh, Hans's uh, approach would not find a seasonal uh, component. As far as I understand the empirical evidence, it tends to favour um, cl classification and then fitting simple models. And in fact, I was reviewing a paper which explored uh, that issue quite recently. So I think it, it, it is a, a topical issue and a relevant one. And as Hans says, uh, it has 
faded from view to an approach which basically starts with the general and moves to the specific um, in a in a coherent framework, but has these dangers. OK, well, thanks, comment. Uh, thanks, Robert, for your comments. Uh, I don't think that we can do much in this uh, meeting today, given that there are technical difficulties. Um, although maybe Stefan has something to add. Uh, he's with us, I see. And given your expertise, maybe you have an opinion. I know that you have an opinion. So Of course, <laughs> Stefan has an opinion. Is there any <laughs> single subject that Stefan doesn't have an opinion about? <laughs> I was going to comment that you wanted to say if Stefan always has something to say. Yeah, actually, I, I like this approach. Um, uh, two, uh, three, uh, two and a half comments, three comments. Uh, first off, uh, Ivan, I don't really think that we need to rely on normality here uh, simply just because mm -hmm. we have ANOVA, because we have uh, thousands of time series, honestly. And what's important sure. is really yeah. very much more the normality of all parameter estimates. So I think you can really apply this approach equally well to intermittent demands or anything else where you might have a seasonal or any other uh, thing because the the indices will be normally distributed in a in an appropriate manner as long as you you define everything well enough it's it's going to be normal enough so i think that works out fine uh, the second uh, thing is um uh, i spied the the word uh, retail somewhere so uh, the question really is how do we apply this to retail um uh, the the simplest approach would be to regress every time series on promotional information that's what i'm most concerned about in terms of, of retail sales, promotional information, just regress on that and then deal with the residuals. And then you could easily even uh, take a look at multiple seasonality. So if you have daily seasonal, daily retail data, you always typically have uh, intra-weekly patterns, intra-yearly patterns. So two kinds of overlapping um, seasonality really. And you could really, really take a look at the, using this approach, look at these two aspects of seasonality separately, which I really kind of like. And that kind of leads me to the other question. There has been some, there have been a couple of papers in the IJF about uh, feature-based model averaging, feature-based this, feature-based that, uh, where they also tried um, extracting features from the time series of the M3, M4, M5, uh, applying PCA or multiple dimensional scaling to really to plot the distribution of the time series in this feature space. And I'm I, I'm kind of wondering on how Hans's approach plays with that, whether that's a, a, a it, it looks rather similar really. So I mm -hmm. was wondering whether he had anything to say on that, but. Yeah, not today, unfortunately. We'll have to meet <laughs> uh, in person and discuss. He may have something to say, but we probably can't hear it, but. Yeah, yeah. Right, thanks a lot, Stefan. Thanks, uh, Robert, uh, for your comments, both. And thanks everyone for attending. So this has been a bit short and uh, hectic um, webinar with some technical issues but hopefully we'll improve next time. So see you next month. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Thank bye, you Ivan. and thank you Hans. Thank you. Th thanks Hans. Bye. I'll send you an email as well. All right, thank you. Okay, bye.